Um, Yechen and I are, are currently in Heidelberg and at one of Europe's oldest universities, but we are working on a very, in the context of a very modern topic, we're here at the Kette Hamburger Center for apocalyptic and post-apocalyptic research. And that gives us an opportunity to um, reconsider our previous work on self, on aesthetics and on relationality, which we have uh, done pretty much in a Confucian paradigm over the last years from a yet different uh, perspective and angle. And- Which is trust. <laughs> which is trust. And in particular, when we take the idea of, um, the, the idea of philosophies around Asian seas literally and ask, well, what are these geopolitical contexts here? Um, we start from the idea that the position of a society in its geopolitical context can be understood from a simple question, who do you trust? But then in practice, it becomes exceedingly complicated because trust um, has a kind of an odd duality. Trust can arise between people in a completely personal interrelational way, but trust can also be uh, counteracted and, and give rise and necessity to say military act, actions and invasion. And if we look at the, the history of um, relationality in the East Asian sphere, it, it, is, it is really complicated. So uh, on this uh, little sketch here, uh, the arrows denote as one example, as a proxy example for the relationship of cultures and the transmission of ideas, the influx of Buddhism from Central Asia at the beginning of the early common area, uh, ending up in Chang'an, um, then uh, moving um, into Korea by the year 400 and by the year 500 reaching Japan and uh, in the uh, year 600 uh, becoming an explicit part of the 17 article constitution of Japan, even though the 17 article constitution itself has an, a large number of Confucian elements, uh, Buddhism is explicitly mentioned there as one of the precepts. Then on the other hand, we have a long uh, series of um, dynastic transitions, each of which were associated with um, conquests, with expanding the empire, and then subsequent cycles of collapse. And, and uh, over time, we see that after the first unification in the Qin dynasty, um, Han expanded towards the Tarim Basin. Um, later, uh, Tang expanded even further into Central Asia. And uh, by the time of the uh, Qing and the modern boundaries, uh, these Western sections of China were completely incorporated. So there's a paradox in this, that uh, on one hand, we have a sharing of ideas, but on the other hand, we have subsequent military con conquests. So either this means that trust is absent, is actually not generated from this sharing of, of ideas, or it appears not to lead to stability in the first place. Yeah, um, so um, everybody knows trust and I think it's very important. And, uh, but when we ask what is trust, it um, seems to be like difficult to say anymore. Because um, if you look at the philosophy, Hegel actually defines trust as the condition of right. But in contemporary philosophical debates, you will see normally people say trust is important, but it is dangerous because it, you make yourself vulnerable and if you're betrayed and it's just a blind. So you, it's better to discover or establish trustworthiness. But if you really think about trust is trustworthiness, what is actually, is it trust at all? Right. If you are trust only the trustworthy, you don't actually need trust for that. Mm -hmm. And I think this is one of the fallacies behind um, the idea of mutually assured destruction coming from uh, gene, uh, from game theory and threatening us all with nuclear annihilation, and also perhaps from mutually assured interdependence, which is a more modern theory, but essentially of the same thing, that it requires mutual assurance. So we have a different approach to this, and we, we want to posit, um, for one, Trust is in fact based on aesthetics. Like many ideas that, that we interpret as being ethical, trust too is ultimately motivated from aesthetics. And encounters require trust, require trust, and do not generate trust. And that's a very, very crucial uh, 
point that needs to be made when we talk about relationality or relationality in societies in general, um, because the encounter is very basic to that. I, I briefly need to introduce you, however, to our ideas of how the self is constituted in the first place and the consequences this has for relationality. So in our view of the yes, self- Yes, uh, just uh, this model is actually based on our understanding of Confucian idea of the separacy, but we used uh, into, uh, into analyze in the frame of uh, philosophy of mind and uh, um, the idea of encounter. Particularly mm -hmm. things that, that uh, uh, phenomenologists like Dan Sahavi have proposed about the philosophy of the mind. But we're taking just one aspect of that, and that is an I, which has self-scope. The self-scope is everything that I think belongs to my I, my memories, my beliefs, my reason, my comprehension, my imagination, and all of that. And that is uh, observed from the I itself and uh, constitutes um, what I am and is uh, mediated through different modes of interactions with the outside world. Intriguingly, however, there's a loop in this in that we also have self-awareness and there's something peering from within us to um, the outside or from the outside to within and the self-awareness leads to a recursive self, a self that is recursively constituted and ever-changing. Um, not just from its experiences, but within, from within itself, in the light of the experiences. And if we then think about um, what happens in an encounter, so we define an encounter to be when an I enters into a relationship with the you and emerges changed. And that's really crucial. Martin Buber has written about this I and you relationship. So, um, the you essentially enters the self scope via a process usually as respect and as a consequence the i shifts to a new i somewhat uh, along the way but that doesn't stop there it gets a lot more complicated because what happens then is of course that the you itself undergoes an encounter it gets changed there's we intentionality that, that emerges true emergence that cannot be reduced either to the I or the you, but constitutes something else. And this is where relationality is positioned, i.e. if we draw up a network of relationalities, our interest is not necessarily in the nodes on, on both sides of this network, but it is in the emergent nature of, of, the, of the edges, of the connections that, that are made here. And this is the point where trust is necessary. So trust is something that enables the relational encounter. In order for the I to be able to risk being changed, it has to feel that that risk is worthwhile to be taken. And that's absolutely crucial because thinking about that immediately locates the moment of trust before the encounter. And at that moment, locating it before the encounter no encounter has yet happened. And there is not a you that already can be perceived. The imagined you is the source of the trust. The imagined you, which is a construct of our um, memories, of our um, um, ideas, our intuitions, our, our predictions about how that encounter will go, enables the trust, which then in turn en enables the the um, encounter with the real you. And this imagined you as a mental construct with a lot of associations um, with everything else we hold in the mind, this thing is an aesthetic experience. This is an aesthetic experience in the sense that it is the moment of realization that an experience resonates with ourself. So um, maybe this uh, theory is quite um, abstract up to now, um, I would like to show you a very concrete example and to see how actually aesthetic elements can enhance or create the possibility of encounter and the trust. But things are a bit tricky because I am mentioning something which might be familiar to all of you. And I really encourage you um, join with me to think about whether this kind of model is possible. So um, this is, uh, of course, the example I choose is the Japanese 
uh, quintessential um, Japanese tea room, and uh, um, it is Taian, um, the only architecture that still survived, designed by Zeno Rikyu. And uh, um, unfortunately, I didn't visit it when I was in Kyoto last time, which makes me very regret. And, and we, uh, because we don't know, we don't know when, yeah, when we can come back, <laughs> um, but we definitely, um, this is the place we want to visit. So I took screenshots from NHK documentary about uh, this um, tea room, um, Taiwan. Um, so um, what kind of aesthetic elements that would create a real sense of encounter and trust? This is I'm interested in. Um, I find there are some peculiar things about this tea room. First of all, the door is very low and very small. So this is how people enter. And no matter how high your social status is, and you have to shake this off and everybody is equal inside this tea room and have to enter in this way. And uh, they have to leave all their thoughts outside in historical time. And then even more peculiar is that this room is not only dark, but also small. It's only composed of two tatamis. And uh, if you think of a tea room, you might think of standard 4.5 tatamis. And uh, Rikyu's um, residential tea room has 18 tatami. But this one he designed especially for Hideyoshi and it, were, it was only two tatamis. And the, within this tea room, basically it's like Chinese mian mian xiang qu, you're just face to face. Mm -hmm. And uh, why it is, um, important to have this kind of closeness. And uh, I think this is really a generator of trust because at this moment when every single movement of your face or of your body is visible, anything in things you're in your mind will be seen. And uh, so what can you do? And uh, you expose yourself and you trust the other. And uh, this is the distance proximate. And the I think it has to be emphasized how close this actually is. Sitting between the tea master and his noble, feudal, illustrious guests, everybody can touch, just by reaching out with his hands, you can touch uh, the shoulder of the person close to you. And if you have a chance of somebody else in, in the room with you, try that. And, and imagine just by gauging this distance, how close this actually is. That's why I think it's actually pre um, pretty interesting if you think of two uh, opponents or enemies, and for some reason they have to uh, encounter to generate some collaboration, and this might be the best way. Um, and then the second element, in addition to this closeness, is I noticed that the wall is made of um, natural material, so it's very rough. And it's completely appealed to sensitive to your sense and sensibility. So it has this fabric, has the some mud and earth, and uh, instead of the very smooth wall we have here, and uh, this has a lot of um, this uh, touch, and uh, so you immediately feel it, and uh, it's maybe just makes you to be uh, sincere. And uh, I think this is also a generator of the aesthetic element of generating trust. And then this is hard to see, <laughs> it's already very dark. But uh, um, in addition to that, uh, if you could notice that the corner of that room, it was not, it is not like rectangular as you see the room corner here um, in our modern buildings, but it's round. It's actually deliberately made round so that your eyes not stick to this um, right corner, but pay more attention to the tea utensils, to the ritual, and to your guests, or the guest to the host, or the tokonomi and the, the, the um, whatever the object um, presented there. So um, this kind of undertone and uh, make it round it shows the care, the care of the mind. And so this care is the third element that I find, which was realized through aesthetics, but has the ethical um, outcome. So as ethics, if we think trust is ethics, in large degree, it was generated or enhances by all these aesthetic elements. 
Um, I just mentioned these three, but we can talk a lot more about this wonderful tea room because it's really influential in the history, um, not only in Japan, but it's like a quintessential Japanese aesthetics, uh, really influential also outside Japan. So do you want to relate to that, how impact Hideyoshi and Riku? Right, yeah. so <clears throat> our thesis here, and, and this is the thesis about relational conflict systems is, <clears throat> We commonly think of, uh, of the impact of the tea ceremony as being an aesthetic accompaniment to uh, the unification of Japan and especially through the incorporation of the Babi Cha elements. Mm -hmm. And, and this, this leading to the idea that the Babi Sabi and the, the simplicity is at the core of what Japanese aesthetics is all about. We would like to, to turn this around though and argue that, um, what happened here is that Sen Norikyu actually created trust for Toyotomi Hideyoshi. The creation of trust as a political asset, I think, uh, is an important factor here. And this is corroborated by the role of uh, Sen Norikyu for Hideyoshi um, at that time. Hideyoshi initially, um, uh, when he was a retainer of Oda Nobunaga and then went on to, to uh, avenge the assassination of Oda Nobunaga, did not have the military strength to overcome all his opponents, far from it. What he needed to do is forge alliances. What he needed to do is to get, get the merchants of Sagai on, on, um, in, on, onto the same um, uh, project. Um, and what he especially needed to do is to negotiate with others and convince them that there are win-win situations there. And that when he was talking about win-win in his new idea of governance and unifying Japan, he was sincere and authentic about it. And part of that, um, we argue, was using the tea ceremony in many different ways as an instrument to create trust and not just to illustrate aesthetic preferences of the time. Yeah. There are other aspects about Taiyan, things like uh, isolation, about seasonality, and perhaps most important about uh, engagement of all the senses that all play into the same into the same direction. Yeah, to just sum up that our topic is trust and we distinguish trust from trustworthiness. Trust does not require trustworthiness. And secondly, trust is an ethical concept. It's actually rooted in aesthetics. Right, and this aesthetic understanding of trust opens options for direct unmediated encounters. We sometimes call them non-transactional -trans relationality. Thank you very much. Thank you.